Hello, hello everybody, welcome back. So, <laughs> today we're going to talk about perfumery as an art form. And of course, you know, what does art mean? You know, it's a very contentious topic, you know, many definitions of art. And here actually I would aspire to be uh, really kind of like not put down any particular view of art, but rather kind of an approach of a yes and, and <laughs> in this way, it's kind of like, you know, the, the metaphor of all of the different people touching a, an elephant, you know, and uh, they, they arrive at very dis different descriptions. But like, you know, maybe actually there is an elephant in there um, that has all the properties and everybody is right to an extent. You know, it's just that nobody is, has the full, full picture. So let's try to get the full picture. Okay, so, but before we, we get there, um, the quilia of the day is aromatic fougere, which is a special, you know, it's, it's a special category within perfumery because other categories in perfumery are things such as, you know, like woody or, you know, uh, like citrus or fruity or floral. And then there's like these odd ones out, just kind of like this aromatic fougere is one category or fougere and then aromatic version and then chypri. And like, what, what is going on with these ones? You know, and uh, I would say that, you know, if you pick a person on the street at random and ask them like, you know, does this smell like a fougere? chances are they will have like no idea what you're talking about right what if, you, if you say does this smell woody like yeah you know they'll, they'll probably say like you know it's, it's woody maybe not it's flowery i don't know <laughs> so what is this fougere thing and uh well before i actually dive into it uh you know the a specific instance of an aromatic fougere is dracar noir which uh is very much quintessential aromatic fougere, and I'll explain why. But it's a uh, quite an interesting scent. It's definitely very psychoactive, and I think that's kind of a kind of on purpose. Uh, another very very beautiful aromatic fougere that I like way more than Dracar Noir, but but they're both great. Is a uh, Azaro Pour Homme, uh, and I'll put a little bit here um, just to. Kind of contrast the two and uh, how do you go about describing what this category of scent is well here's the thing um just as you know <laughs> with uh, trying to understand pleasure or valence you know the pleasure pain axis um you know a lot of people will go about and about it and say something like you know it, it all comes down to like neurotransmitters you know like dopamine and serotonin or something like that or it comes down to, for example, what parts of the brain get activated, you know, like the pleasure centers. Whenever your pleasure centers are activated, you feel good, you know, in a, in a sense. Other people go about it and say like, you know, it's actually reinforcement, you know, like reinforcement learning is the basis of happiness or, 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 or suffering and things of that sort. You know, and maybe other kind of explanations, like, you know, like all suffering is based on resisting or something like that. And I would say like, you know, all of these are kind of circumstantial explanations. They don't actually give you that good of an insight into the actual phenomenology of it. I mean, it actually, does, what does it feel like? And uh, in perfumery, we find the exact same problem that people confuse certain, you know, kinds of descriptions with actual explanations. And I would say they're very, very different, you know? So how do people, if you, if you, you know, find reviews of, Dracar Noir <laughs> in YouTube or, you know, online or whatever, usually the kind of information that people will be giving you will be of the sort of, for example, what is its history? You know, what is the history of that perfume? Which is, you know, valuable information, quite interesting for sure. But does it get to the phenomenology? You know, maybe only circumstantially, tangentially, a little bit. They might also talk about, you know, the looks and, and the social class and what kind of, you know, cultural associations that there is with a particular scent. And, you know, maybe that touches it slightly, <laughs> but not not fully. And, and by the way, you know, Dracar Noir has a ton of cultural associations. Actually, there's a lot of people who make fun of it um, because it's perceived as kind of a, uh, yeah, I guess like a, a, a bead to be, you know, taken seriously, especially for, you know, like teenage, you know, teenage boys, essentially <laughs> to, to, to be perceived, you know, perceived as like very masculine by, by, by women and, and so on. But, you know, again, like that's just a particular cultural use and interpretation is not actually the qualia of it, which is what this channel is fundamentally about. So um, what else? I mean, also people might 
actually tried to describe perfumes in terms of what chemicals are present in them. But if you've never, you know, experienced those chemicals, you have never smelled them, it's not necessarily very helpful. Um, on the flip side, you know, people kind of like the most common and to some extent as good as it gets. And we will do quite a bit of this today, but it's not the full picture and actually we'll transcend it and do something better. But that is to list quote unquote ingredients or notes, which, uh, you know, it, it actually it's kind of insane in, in a lot of circumstances because it is really more of a marketing thing. And actually, there's like very deep reasons why, you know, the notes that are listed are actually not there. Um, is more that like the emergent gestalt of all of the chemicals put together in the perfume give rise to something that is kind of perceptually similar to all of those components. But it's not that like in equal proportions, you know, like all of those ingredients are in there. Uh, like if, for example, like lavender is like, you know, listed as one of the ingredients, it's probably not lavender. You know, it may have like linolyl acetate, which is like one of the molecules of lavender um, and just like mixed in in such a way that in the end there is a bit of a lavender flavor or lavender like hint of it or even like the lavender effect, the kind of effect that lavender has in other compositions without actually having real lavender there. So again, ingredients only go so far. And of course, you know, for kind of biology nerds and, and so on, uh, you will have, uh, yeah, you know, list of receptor types and, you know, like the hundreds of different scent receptors. And again, like that's not very illuminating. Like even if you know the biology of it, just knowing which receptors get activated still doesn't get to the phenomenology. So what can we do here? Um, well, uh, there is this hypothesis uh, advanced by Susan Pocket uh, about, you know, consciousness as an electromagnetic phenomenon. Uh, actually, the evidence, I would say, is like pretty strong, not only, you know, from her, but also McFadden and like a few other people who have been exploring el electromagnetic theories of consciousness. But what really stuck out to me from this book was there's like a, a whole chapter about the evidence that the phenomenology of scent uh, it is not about like specific receptor types. That's just kind of a proximal cause. It's actually about the precise patterns of electromagnetism in the olfactory bulb. And to me, actually, that makes quite a bit of sense because a lot of the phenomenology of scent feels like a dynamic system, states of a dynamic system, you know, a dynamic system, as I've covered, for example, in the Harvard presentation on the hyperbolic geometry of DMT experiences, you know, there's like all kinds of states. Like, for example, there is fixed points, uh, there is, um, you know, noise driven chaos, and then there is, uh, you know, pure noise, and there's like, you know, fractals and patterns of recursion and things like that. Those are like possible attractors in dynamic systems. And to a large extent, I can definitely buy the idea that, you know, the particular qualia that you experience is a state of the dynamic system of your olfactory bulb. And that because of, you know, deep panpsychism and monism, actually, you know, physics um, um, is actually describing the behavior of qualia from a third person point of view. In other words, experience discloses the intrinsic nature of the physical. So yes, uh, basically by understanding the various things that may happen to the electromagnetic pocket in the olfactory bulb, I think kind of like might describe actually the complexity of the phenomenology of scent because so much of scent is not just like, oh, you know, there's like these different colors. It's not kind of like mixing paint. No, 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 because they also imply kind of like movement and effects and momentum or dampening or shearing or spiking. Uh, there's all sorts of like kinetic qualities to the phenomenology of a smell that, yeah, just like, other metaphors with others, you know, uh, qualia just doesn't really cut it. You know, I, I would consider scent as an inherently dynamic component. You know, the, the time axis is fundamental to, to explain that. And uh, in a sense, like the attempt to cash out, you know, phenomenological descriptions of scent into kind of compact descriptions of a dynamic system and its interactions. Yeah, I mean, basically, I would describe that as the aesthetic of Qualia core. Again, it's completely sidestepping all of these ideas of, oh, let's just describe things in terms of its history or its ingredients or something. It's like, no, let's introspect very deeply and 
realize in what ways you are being a fixed point or you're a noise driven chaotic system and <laughs> i mean it's kind of depersonalizing and, and weird but i think it's much closer to the actual truth of the matter and that's yeah very exciting so um let's try to do these four aromatic fougeres um so well i should say a little bit of history which is actually i i consider it pretty silly uh that um in a sense, uh, aromatic fougeres, um, you know, fougeres to begin with, the, the start of it is that there's this uh, a perfume called Royal Fougere. Again, not very useful, right? But like the, 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 the ideology of it was, let's try to imagine what the smell of a fern would be like if ferns had a smell, which of course they don't have a smell, right? So it's imaginative, it's a, it's a fantasy. It's, uh, it's not real, <laughs> but it's like, okay, if a fern had a smell, what would it be? And, you know, you will sometimes find like in some, you know, like perfume or like, uh, I don't know, like uh, essential oil shops and things like that, like, like allegedly the smell of, of a fern. And I'm pretty sure this is like fantasy, like reconstruction or some interpretation because I mean, it smells like bamboo, actually. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, ferns don't have a smell. <laughs> Newsflash. And, uh, and you know, everybody in perfumery knows that this is kind of a, an interpretation. So um, why, uh, how, how, what, how can you do in that case? And uh, well, a fougere, uh, pl just a plain fougere, the thing that will you will associate it with the most is barbershop smell. And this, uh, you know, uh, foam in particular, does have exactly that basic, very basic bare bones fougere effect, which a lot of people also describe as kind of like soapy. Uh, but it's more than soapy. It's kind of like soapy and lavendery. But above all, it has kind of this hay, hay-like vanilla quality. So yeah, it's kind of like soapy vanilla lavender quality. But it has a particular, you know, strange, relaxing, almost dissociative character to it. And, and yeah, in some sense, actually, you know, the corresponding qualia within psychoactive substances, I would say something like ketamine. Fougeres are kind of dissociative in a strange. I think it's like the, the soapy qualia here is kind of like this bed of, in technical terms, within the dynamic system paradigm, it would be impedance matching where basically it absorbs whatever stress or excess energy there is around. And it kind of like, it's kind of like foam in, 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 in a sense, kind of like soapy foam. Um, and not only because it looks like foam, but yeah, no, the phenomenology of the scent, I think is, is, is sort of like that. Um, and um, now that is like kind of the fougere component, but now what about like the aromatic? You know, aromatic, it's very silly, right? Like, like what does it mean for something to be aromatic and the answer is in perfumery aromatic means herbs and spices which again like you need to kind of get into you know reading about the field and so on reading about the the space of, of smells to to know that because you know i remember when somebody was describing a particular perfume as like oh it's modern and herbal and aromatic you like i had no idea what they meant by aromatic you know it's like, oh maybe a technical perfume term and yeah it's herbs and spices so here's a few aromatic smells uh sage for example it's a very very important uh, I, I you get a kick at the fact that they actually describe this as like rubbed sage uh, rather than powdered sage I, I i like that you know they actually describe a little bit the the mechanism uh celery seeds uh cumin um yeah, I and mean, sometimes they uh, describe them between like warm spices and cool spices with like, for example, cardamom being a classic kind of like cool spice because it has kind of this cooling sweetness. But also it has like this sparkly quality. Uh, I guess like spe speaking of sparkly, so this also is kind of within the theme here. I'm going to be drinking some sparkling water. Uh, the reason is going to make sense in a little bit. And also the marketing here, I mean, I've never tried this brand, but I thought it was fitting for this video, which is uh, Liquid Death uh murder your thirst i don't know like if, if you're if you're if this is the one brand of sparkling water you drink i mean unless it's a very special sparkling water yeah it's good um it's like perrier it's like 
as opposed to San Pellegrino. But yeah, very, very, very sparkly. Hmm. If it's, you know, if this is kind of like your one brand of sparkling water, um, yeah, you're probably signaling some level of disagreeableness, right? Or like, you, you know, you, you don't care about other people's opinions or, you know, you're, 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 you have a strong mind, so to speak, strong, strong frames. And uh, the same, you know, if you're very, a very proud Drakkar Noir, a name that suggests <laughs> darkness twice, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I don't know, it's kind of like double darkness twice? I don't know. It's, just, it's a good smell. It's a good smell. Okay, so um, aromatic, you know, I was saying, yeah, uh, a really beautiful aromatic combination I, I, I explore and I really like is um, combining cardamom and white pepper. Uh, because they are very similar. They have a, a lot of overlapping kind of like sparkling effects. One is like kind of like sweet within the sweetness side, one is within the, the salty side, and you combine them, that gets factored out to some extent, and actually you just get like a very strong high energy spark. Okay, so there's that. Now, uh, uh, we also have like ginger. Ginger is a super important one, obviously. Um, coriander. Coriander. Coriander is kind of special because uh, it, it has a lot of the same molecules as like many of these aromatic uh, smells, but uh, it also has a bunch of aldehydes and like, you know, coriander, it's kind of a special case uh, within, within aromatics because those aldehydes and aldehydes generally in perfumery add kind of this high pitch. It's kind of like those like ringing bells, like the upper harmonics of the ringing bells which can make the sound that much more crisp and real. Yes, aldehydes do that to scent, kind of this uh, very high frequency kind of uh, singing. And of course, what I would say is maybe the archetype or the, um, the, the most aromatic of all aromatic compounds, uh, mostly, well, uh, herbs, because it kind of combines the elements of many of them. It's kind of a good center of mass, I would say, is black pepper. And black pepper, yeah, it can go a long way if you use black pepper in perfumery. Uh, just to name a few more, uh, yeah, nutmeg, obviously, uh, cinnamon. Anyway, there's a bunch of like aromatic stuff. And uh, here's what I would say. The aromatic component of an aromatic fougere is an energizer. And I would say phenomenologically speaking, most whenever something has kind of aromatic in it, it means that it's going to feel sparkly. Uh, and this is a you know phenomenological thing. Like imagine the, the qualia of drinking sparkling water. Not the taste, but the dynamic element of like kind of activation. And it's kind of like a lot of stored energy and it kind of like pops all, all over the place. Something like that happens, for example, if you smell cardamom. Kind of like the, lots of little sparks, lots of little sparks. White pepper, for sure. That's kind of a very strong effect. And uh, okay, but what is the difference between the various, you know, aromatic vibes? Uh, I would actually make an analogy, which is there are kind of different types of fireworks. And you know, all fireworks have kind of this like explosive character, but some of them, you know, are kind of like, like just a big explosion with lots of like, you know, lines that you see, you know, tracers. There's other ones that are kind of like, right? Like there's maybe a big one and then like a lot of tiny ones. Then like other ones is just a kind of like a, you know, fragmentation firework, you kind of like it first breaks and then all of them kind of explode at once. And then there's one that's kind of like, it explodes and then like the little ten tendrils like explode as well. And sometimes you get several, you know, kind of chain reaction like that. But they all have these overall kind of like high energy, like sparkly effect, right? They're just like different styles, different styles of that. And I think, and I think uh, that is kind of the differences between like various aromatic, aromatic effects. Um, speaking, uh, you know, within the aromatic fougere world, for example, Dracar Noir, it really is kind of like a blend of a lot of aromatic effects. Um, and it's also one of the reasons why, you know, reading, in, you know, notes and ingredients is actually just not very helpful. <laughs> if you look, go to Fragrantica and you look at the notes of Dracar Noir, I'm just going to read them really quick. It says, uh, 
Lavender, lemon, bergamot, mint, rosemary, lemon, verbena, basil, artemisa, juniper, coriander, cinnamon, wormwood, carnation, angelica, jasmine, oakmoss, leather, fear, fear, uh, pine tree needle, sandalwood, vetiver, patchouli, cedar, amber, raisins. You know, this is a high entropy, you know, high entropy combination of scents in the sense that like, you know, it's making, mixing so many of these aromatic molecules that actually what you get is more kind of the generic aromatic effect. Uh, so, uh, on the other hand, uh, Azaro Pur Om, in, in many ways, it is kind of a generic fougere, except on the aromatic component, which is recognizably anise-like or licorice-like, licorice you know? So, uh, that's one of the things I was talking about, I've talked about in previous videos, which is that oftentimes perfumes will have kind of this structure where uh, maybe the top notes are kind of like generic floral or something like that. The middle notes are going to be something more specific and then the base notes something more generic. In, in other words, you need to kind of like uh, choose where you put the specificity, right? Like if something is like super specific in each of the layers, in each of the, 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 the layers of the pyramid, um, it, 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 it's kind of too distracting. It, uh, and uh, too specific and it doesn't generate the actual vibe that you want uh, but also if you have just generic you know like all the all of the aromatic you know aromatic uh, like herbs and spices put together at once you know and all the flowers put together at once and all the woods put together at once it's it's just like a super super generic smell at that point and uh, you know so you have to strike the balance between recogni recognizability and you know overall kind of breadth of a vibe and uh and i would say in this case you know azaro is much more original than drakkar drakkar is yeah it's like strong aromatic fougere vibe uh um okay now aromatics uh you know i didn't show them but also like oregano basil dill obviously um <laughs> so a lot of these you know like you probably will not have heard of these compounds but like this is kind of like basically you have a linear combination or like you know convex linear combination of these ones which is limonene you know three carine pinene sabinine myrcene uh, myrcene is very important one eight cineol also very important uh phalanthylene uh, borneol tujone and camphor and you know each of these ones is uh i mean they, they will have their specific molecules as well that oftentimes that's where the flavor comes from but the overall character impact is roughly the same in a lot of these spices and herbs. And in that sense, yes, there is the vibe of, you know, an aromatic effect in perfumery. And it will generally have this sparkly, energizing quality. Now, if you only smell that, well, that's a kind of a... Uh, you know, it smells like a kitchen, right? <laughs> it's not like a social smell exactly. Uh, I mean, spices and herbs can be very beautiful smelling, but but if you want the full thing, if you want the the real deal, you need to increase your breadth. So I don't really expect to, there to be kind of like a uh, a, a perfume that um, makes to the top charts <laughs> being just an aromatic perfume. You know, it would be interesting. I, I might actually play with that. But uh, generally speaking, things that are actually, you know, widely loved um yeah they tend to be you know high in breadth you know they will actually pack you know the 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 scent spectrum <laughs> is as it were or the state space it will have a little bit of everything just so that you know it's actually very very rich and and substantial so let's actually get into what the hell <laughs> an aromatic fougere is and what is the qualia that emerges the holistic gestalt qualia of an aromatic fougere and i promise <laughs> you will probably have never seen this kind of analysis anywhere else <laughs> so you know for a first you saw it here okay so um essentially and um again this is gonna be kind of weird uh maybe but um first i'll describe how you actually make one um and it's something that i've spent quite a few experiments doing basically uh making my own you know combinations of essential oils and pure chemicals trying to in a sense deeply understand a particular kind of perfume or a particular kind of scent like 
other exercises that, that I tend to do are things such as like, oh, let's recreate lavender from scratch or let's recreate, you know, lemon from scratch or something like that. In this case, yeah, I mean, I spent some time trying to create a fougere from scratch or from scratch make, you know, essential oils and aroma chemicals. So um, in my estimation, and I'll be kind of like trying to draw the phenomenology here and have a uh, a, 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 a picture of, of what this is like but um okay so first of all the aromatic component and i think this is almost kind of like you know it's not exactly making a salad or something like that but uh or you know getting a your <laughs> a happy meal or something like that i don't know uh a package the like uh, it's kind of a like what do you want for your bread what do you want for your protein what do you want for your sauce this sort of thing but okay so uh, you know, a recipe with a uh, wiggle room, let's say. So the aromatic fougere has, first of all, a layer of aromaticity or kind of these like aromatic quality, which is, I will, you know, symbolically represent it with fireworks. So basically this is kind of like high pitch energizing component of an aromatic fougere. Now, importantly, right below that, there's something that is interacting with it, which is very importantly, lavender. And lavender, um, so lavender is primarily linalool and linalyl acetate which are some super, super important molecules in perfumery. Uh, almost all essential oils have like at least small amounts of linalool or linalyl acetate, mostly linalool. Linalool is like everywhere. Every single perfume has a little bit of linalool, but essentially it's kind of like uh, the butter. <laughs> it, it is a character impact that basically modifies, but the particular way in which it modifies any flavor, anything else you combine it with is something that I call turbulent reverb turbulent reverb so lavender this also happens with a uh, bergamot uh, which is also a very very common note or ingredient and i'm gonna uh, exemplify what turbulent reverb is with kind of like this um this sort of um yeah it's kind of like this flowy type of like air current type of thing um a lot of it like phenomenologically I would actually say is like when you smell lavender um, or anything with a lot of linalool or linalyl acetate uh, here's just an example of, uh, of lavender so uh, yeah so it's kind of like it creates this bed of air pockets it's kind of like and um, and you put anything else together with it and it kind of gets swept by those currents. So that's a, that's a lavender. And, and of course, most aromatic fougeres, I'm sure they don't, nest, you know, they don't contain lavender itself. They may contain linalool, linalyl acetate, several other like alcohols as well that are kind of in that space um, or uh, esters as well. And, uh, and that is, you know, that modifies it. This is like, it's not a flavor per se, it's a modifier. Um, now, in the core of the of the fougere space then becomes um, like once you understand those two kind of like highest layers, it's oak moss. And oak moss is I think like without oak moss, I don't think you have a fougere really. Um, and oak moss is itself a fascinatingly interesting qualia of scent because it has two components. It has two simultaneous and interacting component. So oak moss has first a drying, powdering qualia effect. So imagine it's kind of like in the desert, you know, it, it rains and there's a bunch of mud and then like it gets dry and, you know, you know kind of like it gets, uh, it cracks, you know, the crackling, sometimes it looks kind of fractal as well, like the crackling when things get dry. Um, imagine that, but the, in the olfactory bulb. Um, so that is like one of the main effects of oak moss and there's a gravity and seriousness to it. It's kind of like, oh my gosh, I'm getting, I'm drying out, I'm drying out. It's, it's very strange. It's very strange. 
and and you combine it with other things i mean like there's other other scent varieties for example that feel the opposite they are kind of like wetting they 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 increase the wetness or the moisture <laughs> whereas oakmos is decidedly decidedly something that dehydrates uh phenomenologically again like of course it doesn't have i'm sure it has nothing to do with that but um uh, phenomenologically there's the feeling of getting dried and becoming more powdery um, also oakmos the second effect it has is is kind of this um almost like spicy like spicy in the sense of chili like um it has like these like spikes and that that you know that kind of like is more kind of in the aromatic space of kind of like fireworks but uh, oakmos has both of those so it's kind of like sparkly and also has this drying effect again very very peculiar and the way i will um symbolize that is as uh yeah basically kind of like the crackling of mud after you expose it to a bunch of sun and <laughs> yeah basically something like that and a little bit of kind of like sparks but yeah basically that is the other layer that that, that is a part of the aromatic fougere space uh, and then there's a final one which is the <laughs> And I mean, of course, if you if you know about aromatic fougeres, you will probably know what I'm about to say. Otherwise, it will probably be surprising. But this is coumarin. And coumarin essentially has two main facets. One is the smell of hay, which is kind of this uh, green, uh, green herbal quality. Uh, think of like, yeah, grass or, or like dry grass, uh, hay, hay effect. And the other one is a vanilla effect and what these does i mean they're slightly different like vanilla could also work and it would have the same gestalt effects except the flavor would be different so classically it's coumarin it's not vanilla although there's like fougeres that have vanilla as well but um essentially uh what coumarin will do is oh it also has kind of like a chocolatey not not nutty quality i would describe it as it adds a bed of sweetness where everything actually can be collected. So, you know, there's, for example, orange Julius <laughs> or creamsicles. Uh, yeah, you know, like, um, it's very silly to say that, for example, like an orange creamsicle, the secret ingredient is vanilla. But actually, you know, there is an interaction between vanilla and uh, any citrus, essentially, that softens it. And it's kind of like you get to experience the flavor of something citrus without the bite. And vanilla and vanilla-like effects, like coumarin, um, generally have that softening around the edges. And also kind of like, um, yeah, it's kind of like mist that, in a sense, like uh, softens the edges. Let's put it that way. Okay, so... What you have in an aromatic fougere is fundamentally these four kinds of qualia in your nose, in your olfactory bulb, in a sense, simultaneously coexisting. So again, kind of these like, well, uh, the dynamic ends up being that, you know, you get kind of a, uh, these like soft, like sweet quality that again, it's kind of like being dried out simultaneously as like reverbified and there's a ton of turbulence and then there's fireworks on top of that. Now, how does that actually cash out in a compact phenomenology and you know again this is kind of like a broad level like note level description so but what is the actual phenomenology here and um i would describe it essentially in the following way which is that because of the aromatic quality of the aromatic fougere you essentially and i'll symbolize it you know basically this is kind of like a very energized high frequency character um that then uh gets contained within a dry kind of almost um uh yeah very very drying very very uh dehydrating uh aura uh and finally all of that gets absorbed by a powerful soapy coumarin like 
impedance matching effect. So <laughs> basically, you'll have these kind of explosive, you know, fireworks from the aromatic component that then are being dried out and the residue of the energy, which can be kind of sharp, gets smoothed out by a soapy layer that functions as kind of a everything is fine in the end and is a uh, yeah kind of like dissociative as well so it's um the, the psychoactive effect of aromatic fougeres is that of essentially being a dissociative stimulant uh or as they call it in drug culture which i don't endorse um uh calvin klein uh i remember being at a at a concert with a few friends and a friend of a friend said he was on Calvin Klein. I asked, what, what is Calvin Klein? He's like, oh, cocaine and, and ketamine, which, by the way, I'm sure is terrible for your cardiovascular system. Kids, <laughs> don't, do, don't do that. It's also exactly the sort of thing that Dare would advise you. He's like, oh, they give you cute, cute names like Calvin Klein or, you know, anyway, this is horrifying. But it's kind of like this dissociated state that is stimulated. So that is what I think the aromatic fougere is. Uh, it also has like shades of, for example, when you're coming up on alcohol on a small dose or like a drink or two, um, that you get simultaneously kind of like this strange dissociation, but then also maybe like more confidence and like energy to do things. And like, maybe I think like it's kind of, kind of in that space of like, hey, like, yeah, let's help a, you know, awkward, you know, 18 year old kid who, um, is a uh, very very afraid of approaching members of the opposite or members of the same whoever the, the, this person is actually very interested in and um, uh, and you need kind of the mixture of an energizer and a dissociative so that you kind of do things without really knowing what you're doing without grasping the consequences you know makes you more bold yeah that's kind of the aromatic fougere effect and I mean, no doubt, it is very much like marketed as a masculine kind of a, uh, you know, conqueror type person, you know, in your prime of your sexual um, uh, age or so, uh, reproductive age. Okay, so uh, there's all of that. Now, uh, I'll briefly review a couple uh, aromatic fougeres within this framework. Again, qualia core. Mm. I actually have a little box. It's one of the, as, as I've said before, you know, I like to do state space exploration in two ways. A, via depth, which is going very deep into a very specific kind of quality and exploring the various, you know, varieties of it, the various like variations of it. And then you have the breadth, which would be kind of, you know, the, like trying to get one of everything. <laughs> and like, you know, within psychoactive substances, the high breadth would be somebody like Sasha Shulgin. The high depth would be something, somebody like uh, John Lilly, you know, kind of like going very deep in a very specific direction. There's advantages and disadvantages, but I actually prefer to have a, a balance between the two. So for some things I might go very deep, for others, give me just one of everything. <laughs> so I know the lay of the land. And uh, with aromatic fougeres, I've gone pretty deep. Uh, I essentially have a, a box <laughs> full of aromatic fougeres and I actually have more at a friend's house uh, for, for complicated reasons. Um, but uh, yeah, just a, just a few ones. I mean, like, uh, I would say probably for me, the quote unquote a reference aromatic fougere would be Versace pour Homme, which is essentially a very, very aromatic and very, very citrusy kind of aromatic fougere. And it's um, uh, as clean as it gets. Uh, people also compare it to basically um, uh, laundry smell. So yeah, it's kind of like the most light aromatic fougere that I know of. And to some extent it's like a very basic, but very clean and, 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 and beautiful taken as a qualia. Um, I would say Versace Eros is borderline and not an aromatic fougere. Uh, it kind of manages to strike the same vibe, but it just doesn't have, or like the border, borderline doesn't have the soapy character, which, um, to me, it's kind of like a deal breaker. You know, you want that dissociative effect, that kind of a strange feeling of um, kind of like floating and not truly being connected to your body. I mean, again, like, you know, collecting qualia, that's the sort of thing that you, you actually care about. And like, if your aromatic fougere is not doing it for you, you know, you've got to complain to the manager 
So then we have uh, Drakkar Essence, which um, also... No, I think the, the issue with this one is that uh, it, it really goes mild on the aromatic aspect. So it's kind of more a much more of a tame fougere. Wouldn't necessarily recommend it. A lot of people make good reviews of Dylan Blue Versace. Um, I'm not a huge fan of it, um, but it is apparently one of the highest rated aromatic fougeres out there. Which to me, I, I mean, the problem with it, it smells too much like grape. Um, too much like grape. And uh, that's, that's the thing too, like a basic fougere accord risks being confused with grape smell uh which is not exactly fair i would say um and some people make fun of fougeres for that reason but you know I'll, i'm going to defend the fougere and say like no it's actually a high entropy alloy of sense it's not just a it was just a, a grape by a different name that would be just uh you know anyway uh squinting very hard and trying to compare it to something that you smelled before but actually the subtleties have all of these beautiful interactions uh eternity uh, uh for men uh i actually prefer the Eau de Toilette a lot more than the Eau de Parfum, but they're both apparently extremely classic. And uh, Eternity for Men, the EDT, uh, I read somewhere and I haven't been able to really verify it, but apparently it is the like single best-selling men's perfumes of, of all time, uh, which actually wouldn't surprise me because Eternity for Men is basically a super solid, very well-structured aromatic fougere where the aromatic component is uh, sage. Uh, so if you like sage <laughs> among the various possible uh, herbs and spices in your kitchen cabinet, maybe go for Eternity uh, by Calvin Klein. Mm. And of course that, um, yeah, I mean, a lot of Kabbalistic reasons too, you know, it's Calvin Klein, you know, cocaine, ketamine, we established that aromatic fougeres is kind of this stimulating dissociation um, another one. Oh yeah, this is kind of like uh, pure lavender. Pure. I, I really don't understand this marketing. Um, I don't know. I, I got it like very early on in my journey of exploring scents and uh, I was actually kind of disappointed that it's much more than lavender. Uh, I mean, but you know, within the context of aromatic fougeres, this would be an exceptionally lavender-y aromatic fougere. Um, but you know, and actually at the time I thought like, oh my gosh, this is such a strange and special lavender. Um, but you know, as I've learned more, uh, one night I remember <laughs> uh, stumbling upon uh, vanillis, which is a particular synthetic vanilla and, um, you know, in, m you know, mixing it with other things um, in kind of the fougere space. And it's like, oh my gosh, this is starting to smell very much like pure lavender <laughs> by Ferrari. And then I figured out that, yeah, it's probably not a very complicated scent. It's actually just like vanillis or another molecule like it, um, which once you smell it on its own, it's not very inspiring, uh, personally. Uh, and yeah, just a, a Aspen is kind of like a a, a, a a copy, pretty much, of a cool water, except a little bit more, uh, more herbal. And cool water, you know, made a big splash <laughs> back in the day. Um, uh, by Davidoff and um, uh, cool water is very much something that I recommend mixing with you know very relaxing songs and Shenzhen Young's focus on rest as a meditation technique because they go really well together so that is uh, yeah the aromatic fougere component of, of the video and now I'm just gonna kind of a uh, go over in a sense various lenses of art uh, within perfumery and relating it to the aromatic fougere uh, for all of you to in a sense get that perspective so uh, and i have a presentation about this in the qualia research institute youtube channel um, where i go over qri's eight models of art and essentially uh, you can also get these uh, by buying this magazine there's going to be a, a link in the description um, and um, it's an article that I published in this, you know, Berlin-based art magazine called Harmonic Society. Um, Harmonic Society, eight models of art for a scientific paradigm of aesthetic qualia. And, you know, the, the very uh, first page itself, you know, it's kind of like a bunch of visual textures that I have been 
collecting over the years. I have, yeah, basically folders with thousands of pictures of, <laughs> of textures that I have taken over the years. Uh, because, yeah, I'm basically interested in state spaces of qualia in general. And, and visual textures is, is one of them. Um, but um, essentially, in this article, what I present is kind of this elephant <laughs> type, you know, triangulation of what art could be. Um, and actually is aimed towards transcending postmodernism and also, you know, meta or like debates after postmodernism about like, you know, whether there's anything that will have kind of a universally recognized meaning in art as opposed to like, hey, all being like culture bound and subjective. And as you will see, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's actually possible to transcend um, in a sense, relativism within art. We can actually, actually go to the core of it and it will cut to the very, very core of reality itself and the nature of value. Um, but yeah, anyway, it's kind of crazy. So the very first model is this called semantic deflation. Um, and that is applied to perfumery, essentially trying to interpret art as the redef re like as redefining art itself. So um, Dada, for example, or surrealism, like uh, there was a little, there have been a lot of uh, movements in, in art that like the whole point is to kind of like redefine art at the very basics, uh, kind of like fundamentally reconfigure what art even means. And like a lot of, you know, art pieces are kind of like that when, if you know, if, if your girlfriend or, or boyfriend says something like, like, oh, I could have done that myself, or like, is that even art uh, at a, in an art gallery? Like, yeah, it's probably kind of in the semantic deflation aesthetic. And I would say, um, especially, yeah, I mean, basically uh, uh, Wittgenstein type analysis of like language games and so on, where, yeah, fundamentally things don't have inherent meaning and everything is kind of contextual. And like, you know, semantic deflation is, is a, particular aesthetic on art or um, aesthetic for modeling art. Um, and if you apply that to perfumery, you know, you get things such as like making a perfume of bed linings or something that smells like lobster or popcorn or, or toast <laughs> or, or something like that, which, uh, yeah, basically is kind of like, hey, like, look, I'm so original and innovative that I can actually transcend the common sense view of what perfumes are supposed to be like, you know, so that's one interpretation. Uh, okay, the second one is um, essentially uh, signaling of genetic fitness. <laughs> a lot of art actually is about that. I highly recommend uh, The Mating Mind by Jeffrey Miller because, you, you know, kind of like goes very deep into like in what ways uh, the features of art can be well explained in terms of signaling, hey, like how much, you know, how energetic you are or how uh, competent or skilled or, you know, able to make other people do things for you, etc., etc. Um, and so to, to some extent in this model, art is actually a lot about uh, waste. <laughs> it's just kind of a carefully crafted waste that shows that, hey, you can afford to waste a lot of resources. Um, but there's, there's also kind of like another facet to these, which is um, that art conceived in this way, it will be optimized in order to be impressive within uh, courtship or even to kind of like impress uh, friends and, you know, possible, um, you know, your, your boss or whatever it may be. Uh, so a lot of that kind of like focuses on a branding of like exclusivity or envy, <coughs> sorry, uh, positional goods, uh, kind of like, oh, this is very, very pricey. Um, or this kind of this angle of like, oh, this has like aphrodisiac effects. So definitely the marketing of like, you know, things like, uh, Dracar Noir and uh, <laughs> uh, and Azara Pur Om. Yeah, I mean, de definitely within the context of how, you know, people might conceptualize the art of perfumery. Uh, this one in particular would, yeah, definitely fit into the quote unquote weapons of sexual conquest, which of course I think it's, uh, you know, it's interesting and anthropologically important and also hedonically, uh, you know, if there's something that you can put on and legitimately have more fun sex or legitimately have kind of like a more erotic experience like hey like that's that's interesting let's uh, let's uh, you know study that and like investigate to what extent that it can actually impact your hedonic tone and yeah i think that's uh, quite fascinating uh, unfortunately though i think like as a way of conceptualizing the scope of art it's profoundly limiting 
and in fact uh, quite uh, misguided for the most part. Um, and uh, it also encourages to kind of like over focus on kind of like very loud signals. Um, again, like I appreciate aromatic fougeres as qualia for sure, but you know, in a context of some like a, a bunch of people wearing different styles of perfumes, like if there's a guy who's like wearing a, a fruity perfume, another guy who's wearing kind of like a you know woody or or like even flowery perfume or citrusy, and there's somebody with an aromatic fougere that is like a powerful one, like Azaro or something like that. Yeah, the main thing that you will probably smell around is the aromatic fougere, and in, in this sense. This is similar to kind of the, the crab bucket phenomenon uh, in like music as well. That like uh, to a large extent, a lot of music, uh, uh, especially like that is geared towards uh, being played at parties, um, is actually you know maxing out the volume across the spectrum such that like if there's a, another song that plays uh, only within certain components of the spectrum. Uh, you won't hear it as well like the one that will kind of even if they're the same volume Basically one of them will be like kind of like much more noticeable will be the, the stronger signal the thing that is actually generating the ambiance the most and in that sense Yeah, you know, that's not necessarily for social actually it can be quite anti-social and it's unfortunate that given the selection pressures for marketing and for you know the actual industry of like what is it that people will act you know pay money for uh, yeah, this in a sense encourages the creation of loud perfumes and i'm not sure you know that's really optimizing for the qualia or for you know there's other models of art that are in a sense able to do more interesting pro-social you know positive sum games or super positive sum games where everybody wins so um the third model of art is basically creation of new contexts or art as a shelling point and here, its intersection with perfumery would be in a way when perfumes are uh, attempts, at, in a sense, like give you, you know, the signature of your personality. Or maybe you, you make a perfume in order to commemorate, you know, your circle of friends. Um, yeah, that's kind of like a, a lot of like very beautiful, wholesome activities that you could do here. And also, you know, marketing can exploit this as well, in a sense, kind of by looking into ways to define particular social contexts and then embed a product within it you know uh, <laughs> because you know it signals a particular psychological trait or a particular attitude or belief uh, etc you know so um, yeah the creation of shelling points can be very wholesome and I think like we should explore that more but definitely dissociated from kind of commercial interests which yeah will tend to cheapen it you know um, and uh, yeah, I mean, in terms of like the industry, like if you go to like a niche perfume store, uh, yeah, I mean, this is kind of what they're playing with is the creation of new shelling points is not, hey, I have a lot of money that I can afford Creed, Creed Adventus, which is a fruity Shypri that costs, I think, like $300 or something like that. Like, no, you don't need to go there. You can also say I bought this like relatively cheap perfume, but hey, I selected it among hundreds of them because somebody guided me through it and helped me figure out what is my essence, you know, or something like that. And th that can be pretty cool. Uh, okay. Uh, the fourth model is uh, sacred, you know, art as a sacred or the pursuit of sacredness. And uh, in perfumery, you know, these will usually be more along the lines of um, symbolism or practice. So like, for example, incense is obviously a very spiritual type of scent uh, because people associated with meditation or like, you know, um, spiritual events of, you know, uh, at the mass or something like that. Um, well, presumably you could also go further, right? Like you could say something like the nectar of life. You know, this is scent is a representation of the nectar of life or the embodiment of the nectar of life or things like that. And I'm sure you can probably experience like fairly spiritual uh, feelings if you kind of like canalize the energy that way. And that could be an interesting application. And yeah, I mean, and for sure, I think like within psychedelic experiences or uh, you know, transcendental states of consciousness, some scents can be very helpful. Some scents are very detrimental. So it actually goes both ways. And uh, some knowledge of like, you know, you probably don't want to, yeah, uh, have like Dior Addict or, <laughs> or Endless Euphoria, which are like, yeah, too much of the kind of like weapons of sexual conquest type scents. You're going to, you know, be 
you know, smoking 5-MeO DMT or something like that. You, you probably would want something much more, much more wholesome um, that uh, kind of like activates a more essential self or your, your feeling of, you know, bare humanity as opposed to like something that is making you horny. <laughs> so, yeah, so uh, some awareness here actually makes, a, makes quite a bit of sense. Uh, then we have uh, the last four models, which uh, uh, I'll uh, describe briefly are actually the models that are the most interesting because they advance our conception of art in a way that will be, in a sense, what I call Quilia computing complete. So in a sense, you have kind of, you know, Turing completeness within uh, computing theory. Uh, we're like, okay, like this, like this is the s simplest, you know, computing device with which you can compute any program type of thing. Well, I think like the, the last four models are kind of like the simplest description that then allows you to, in a sense, fully explore all possible art and uh, that's what's you know very exciting for me so model five is basically art as the exploration of the state space of consciousness uh and this is you know it's kind of like under the assumption that you know there's like a lot of hidden gems in the state space of consciousness and uh within this you know even an aromatic fougere uh would be kind of an instance of hey somebody found a you know high entropy alloy of like interactions of quilia you know, varieties or dynamics. And uh, it's like, oh my gosh, this produces a emergent gestalt that is like really unique and worth uh, investigating and has like interesting qualities and, and uh, even uh, affects your emotions in particular ways. And that is, you know, very beautiful. And like the, the metaphor then becomes like, let's mind the state space of consciousness, but don't do it randomly, you know, just selecting, you know, one possibility at a time and just kind of uh, exploring the, uh, the library of Babel, you know, with all combinations, you, you've got to be judicious about like, how do you carve the space so that you actually have like much higher chances of finding things that are truly, truly, truly great uh, in the state space of consciousness. Um, and, uh, uh, but <laughs> um, the, the, the sixth one, uh, in a sense, is not as general, but I think it's much more pragmatically powerful, which is, art as the exploration of high energy and high energy basically is kind of this um, a very very key component of art because a lot of art focuses on for example novelty just giving you enough novelty that it actually puts you in a different state of consciousness uh like kind of like energized or inspired or or even unsettled uh even you know the the, the term unsettled feel, feeling unsettled it actually suggests kind of like a destickification from your preconceptions and that you're kind of like in a more fluid state, um, which, yeah, I mean, within QRI paradigms, this is, in a sense, kickstarting and annealing process that by unsettling you, unsettling your underlying constraints, you can kind of like explore the dynamics of consciousness in the higher energy realm, which sometimes can have like computational benefits, such as solving constraint satisfaction problems, uh, or even just kind of like exiting a, a frame that is uh, unhelpful, you know, strongly held frames are oftentimes unhelpful and, and uh, basically high energy can be a, an instrument for that. Now in, in the context of, uh, yeah, basically perfumery, uh, yeah, high energy, you could instantiate it with kind of things that are like, you know, very sparkly that inherently they're kind of like high volume and high voltage. Uh, so in the, you know, aromatic, <laughs> uh, the aromatic vibe in perfumery would definitely be kind of in the energizing component. Uh, novelty too, right? Like if you create something that, you know, people has, have never experienced before, not even remotely, you know, just kind of so out there as an outlier of like uh, completely new combinations or many combinations at once that people have never smelled. Yes, that's going to be very, very, very exciting in a very literal sense of, uh, the novelty will f function as an energy source. So even if the smell is not itself energizing, is not high voltage, if it's novel enough, it will have the effect in the entirety of the nervous system to actually excite you. So that would be another way of yeah, instantiating high energy. Um, <clears throat> and finally, like new gestalt effects, which is that we're like, maybe it's not the combination per se, but the combination per se gives rise to a, you know, effect in the dynamic system that is your entire you know, nervous system uh, that itself is energizing or perhaps like taps into, res you know, stored sources of energy or, you know, uh, untangles particular stress that then release that energy into the rest of the system. Um, and the last two models are basically uh, art as, 
essentially the cultivation of and the study of high valence uh, states of consciousness. And uh, I mean, this is kind of like synergistic with the energy uh, one, because with energy, uh, you can, you know, unsettle and then like slowly cool down, which in a sense might rearrange the system in a more harmonious symmetrical configuration. And in that sense, yeah, basically just high energy can give rise to high valence. However, you, there, you can also produce high valence by directly simply generating very harmonious patterns and maybe like playing a little bit with kind of like uh, both energy and harmony um, so that you in a sense get the maximum positive valence which is the multiplier of how energized you are times how harmonious the state is and uh, yeah i mean basically in the case of sense that is the whole study that i mean currently there isn't anything particularly great here i think this is just alchemy for the time being but basically we need something like music three music theory equivalent but for sense and i think it's not going to be as simple as you know like one molecule one note or anything of the sort or even like one molecule and one spectrum uh not even that because i think for reasons that i'm not going gonna go into i actually suspect that the state space of scent is hyperbolic and a lot of kind of like uh, non-linearities arise when you combine them and also you get like gestalt effects that are like on a different level than the kind of gestalt effects that you get in in sound uh and even in sound you actually get a lot of gestalt effects so yeah, I mean, the state space, I think, is very non-trivial, although you can probably still get maybe something like 60 or 70 percent of the variance with just you know, something like a principal component or non-negative matrix decomposition analysis where, yeah, you do have like a few core vectors. But then actually a lot of the subtleties are in the precise ways in which actually the sense don't follow those vectors. They actually sometimes do entirely different things. So... Um, valence essentially, yeah, I mean, this is kind of like taking the find the gems in the state space of consciousness to a new level, which is find the, you know, high valence gems in the state space of consciousness. And yeah, those are like extremely precious, extremely precious uh, discoveries. Uh, of course, very difficult to communicate to others for the time being, but hopefully we will develop paradigms to do that. And finally, 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 the eighth model of art uh, well, and I guess like in scent, I mean, like uh, for the valence paradigm, we basically would, yeah, we, we would be studying, for example, what is the, the what are the conditions for the qualia of sweetness uh, in scent or basically acquired taste. What are like the actual gear level mechanisms uh, that enable a negative valence of scent be transformed into something that is actually positive. And again, like dynamic systems, uh, I think like here are going to be very important. Uh, and of course, like anything in the category of like annealing dynamics that give rise to higher valence, that's also there. Uh, and yeah, basically harmonic society would be the last one, which is how do you actually allow the cooperation in a super positive sum uh, game style between different kinds of aesthetics? And I think, I mean, this is like an NP hard problem, I think, uh, but yeah, basically, to give you uh, an idea, this is the vision here is not one of like, hey, all of society is kind of like dancing to the exact same tune. And it's also not everybody's doing their own thing um, because that's locally dissonant and un uncomfortable. So this, the balance that ideally we strike is where actually there is lots of different clusters of different kinds of dances and aesthetics, but they are, they are like locally consonant with the ones they interact with so even though maybe you can take like two of those clusters and make them interact and it will be horribly dissonant that they're still connected through various links uh, between them such that each connection is actually synergistic in a positive way and in a sense that is kind of like taking a music theory approach at the highest level but for the interaction between aesthetics uh, something that I will talk a lot more about, which gives rise to essentially what Romeo discusses as the super cooperation cluster, um, which is basically all of the aesthetics that can actually synergize with one another. There's probably like a core of like, yeah, some really interesting high value stuff there. Um, and in a sense, like the applications of these to, to scent is figure out what kinds of styles of sense can actually coexist such that neither of them is in a sense kind of just being very loud for the purpose of in a sense like sending the strongest signal but in a sense it would be 
a study of how people's smells and perfumes could combine with one another such that when there's several people in the room, the end result is actually high harmony and very beautiful scent that is not just kind of this crazy dissonant competition between them. And that would be the application of the aesthetic of harmonic society to this. And with that, uh, yeah, that is the art of perfumery, or at the very least, the future of the art of perfumery. And uh, once again, I recommend uh, buying this magazine. And uh, yeah, I mean, if you're interested in, uh, yeah, supporting, uh, <laughs> I mean, this is definitely something I do in my free time, but, you know, more generally speaking, kind of developing paradigms for exploring state spaces of, of consciousness. Yes, if supporting QRI and um, um, yeah, and I'll see you soon. Uh, all right. Thank you so much. And infinite bliss, everybody.